Okay, welcome. Thank you guys so much for joining. I'm so curious to hear. Thank you guys. Where are you joining from? This is definitely one of our more international webinars. So I would love to hear where you're joining from. Drop it in the chat. I am joining from the Bay Area. Ooh, Palo Alto. Perfect. Oh, I know that guy. I think his name is Team Robbie. Huh. I wonder where I know him from. <laughs> That's our founder and managing director of The Hive. For those who don't know, those who are joining us for the first time today, if it's your first time, welcome. Welcome to The Hive Think Tank. Welcome to today's webinar. We're so excited. And if you're a returning customer of ours, thank you so much for coming again. We're so excited for today's webinar. This is an amazing panel of phenomenal women who are going to share their stories, their successes, their challenges, just all the things that entrepreneurs and founders have to go to, but with the added twist of what it means to do that as a woman. So real quick, we're gonna go through the ground rules for today's webinar. And I'm gonna tell you guys a little bit about the Hive Think Tank before I pass over the virtual mic to TM Robbie. So for today, this session is being recorded. I've gotten a lot of emails about that. It's being recorded and you guys are gonna get an automatic email for our YouTube channel that will be sent out to you from 24 hours from today. So don't worry if you have to drop off early or if you have a colleague that couldn't make it, you can totally share that video link. Next thing is we love questions. Love, 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 love. So when you guys ask questions, you need to do me a favor, please, 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 and use the Q&A button. It's actually right below the screen. If you guys look at your screen, you're going to see some buttons at the bottom, and there's one that says Q&A. So if you click that, it'll have a pop-up window, and you can actually write in there, and that makes it a lot easier because sometimes if you guys ask questions in the chat, they get lost in the chat log, and we definitely want to make sure you guys have the opportunity to ask your questions, and you can upvote them, so make sure to use the Q&A button. Okay, without further ado, the Hive Think Tank. So the Hive Think Tank, what do we do? Oh, by the way, my name is Maddie Watt, if I didn't already say that. So nice to meet you guys. I'm the Senior Manager of People and Programs at the Hive. And one of the main things that I do is uh, take care of the Hive Think Tank. So the Hive Think Tank is an ecosystem of entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and corporations. And really our role is to be a gateway to this innovation circle that is not only in Silicon Valley, but it's definitely going around the world. So we are kind of like the glue or the entrance to all of that. And we have content and events uh, on our blog. And then we're doing these virtual events pretty much every other week. So we would love for you guys to join us. I will drop the links to join our meetup group. And we would love to have you at our next event. Ravi, next slide, please. Oh, and sorry, thank you to our sponsors. If you want to learn more about sponsorship, I will put my email in the, in the chat and you guys can reach out to me. Also, if you are a female entrepreneur or founder on this call, we would love to hear more from you and definitely email myself, Cheryl, uh, Ravi, any of these lovely ladies on the call. So please reach out to us. Finally, next slide. Thank you, Ravi. We are having an amazing cybersecurity and anti-ransomware um, event that will be on Thursday, the 24th, if you're in the U.S. at 11 a.m., it's a crazy time for those of you that are in Southeast Asia. So that might be one that you want to catch the recording for, but definitely register so that way you get the automatic email with that recording link. Okay, without further ado, here's Ravi. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you, Matty. First, thank you for, for organizing it. And uh, we especially also want to thank these ladies for, for participating in the event today. Just briefly about the Hive US, and then I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Sharil Ibrahim, to talk about the Hive Southeast Asia. So the Hive is a, is a venture studio. It's a subclass of uh, venture capital, which is very focused on working with entrepreneurs, working with corporations to help create the companies. The, the common thread across all the Hive companies is the using data and AI to drive digital transformation and to drive sustainability. Today, in this day and age, just driving growth is not sufficient. So we, we have to take care of the planet and, and take care of our futures also. Um, we are very thematic in our approach and you see in this is the Hive US and, and by the way, 
I've Southeast Asia has a very similar focus. So you see sort of we leverage variety of deep tech areas and, and, and use it to drive new opportunities, create disruption, um, digital transformation, sustainability in a whole set of industries that are, that are uh, listed above. We are a global entity and we are especially pleased today to be hosting this event with the Hive Southeast Asia. So in addition to our presence in the US and Silicon Valley, we, we have in Sao Paulo, the Hive Brazil, um, in, in Bangalore and Mumbai, the Hive India. Um, we recently uh, collaborated with the finance minister and the Dana Panjana initiative to create the Hive Southeast Asia based in in KL, but to cover the entire uh, Southeast Asia region. Uh, later this year, we are collaborating with uh, a variety of different entities in Saudi Arabia to create the Hive MENA to be based in Dharan and Riyadh. And later next year, in, in the first half of next year with the European Investment Fund, we are, we are going to be creating the Hive Europe uh, based in Paris and, and Berlin. So if you're going to be on Twitter today, please use the hashtag HiveData uh, so that others can join in the conversation. With that, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Charlie Bryan. Thank you, Ravi. Um, um, my name is Sharil, and I'm one of the managing partners alongside Hivesum of Hive Southeast Asia. Uh, we're the newest member of the Hive family. Um, and as Ravi mentioned, we're an early stage uh, venture fund with specialization in creating companies or co-creating companies with talented entrepreneurs and founders. And you know, we celebrate diversity and we lo would love to hear from female founders and, and what you're building. Um, we were one of the funds selected by Dana Panjana, and uh, we were selected because of our DNA in building companies. And uh, our focus is to help strengthen the startup and venture ecosystem in Malaysia and, uh, and to build digital resiliency. So today, uh, I'd like to welcome you to another segment of our Think Tank series. Um, these talks, as Matty mentioned, are uh, panels and knowledge forum focused on the forefront of issues in technology, society, sustainability, and how startups are handling it. Uh, we do these talks about twice a month, and today we're very excited to bring you a panel on empowering women entrepreneurs. Um, the panel is being moderated by Mindy Yong, uh, and um, uh, Mindy's had a, an amazing career and uh, and uh, she's both an investor as well as uh, a founder of a, a number of things. And I'll just maybe tell you a little bit about her. Um, so she did her undergraduate work and also a graduate work in the US. She interned at a venture capital firm, Spring Mill Venture Partners, even before venture capital was trendy. So she got insight in how it all works. Um, she uh, served um, um, Malaysia through Pamandu, a strategic think tank. Focus, focused on national transformation. And so she has insight on both sides of the table, both as an investor and an entrepreneur. Um, today, she's a director of Global Kiara Investments, uh, but more importantly, she's very passionate about education and early child learning. So she's a, a director of Course Networking, a collaboration platform for education in corporate and government institutions, a founder and CEO of Kitsi, an uh, online platform for kids' activities, uh, a founder of Lindy's, an integrated space for play, work, and food, uh, basically a sanctuary for family and working parents. And, you know, her, her resume goes on and on, but like many women, she juggles many responsibilities. She's also a mother and a master in uh, multitasking. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to pass the mic over to Mindy, who will be moderating our panel, a uh, very distinguished panelist. Uh, Mindy, over to you. Wow, what an introduction. Thank you so much, Shariel. Um, and I will tell you, everybody, um, the ladies today on the panel is even more wow. So I'm very excited to have all of them um, in this panel. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to let each and every one of them introduce uh, themselves because they're all amazing and have multiple roles and have juggled multiple things as well in their career. So why don't we start off with Rafiza and then followed by Pris and Joan. 
Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, the hive. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor. So um, I'm the group CEO of Cradle Fund, which is a, a, a government link company under the MOF. And what we do is we give grants uh, to early stage startups. So far, we've supported more than 1,000 early stage startups since 2003. Uh, so there's some notable names here. Um, I'm a mother. I have three kids. Uh, I have a husband who's an entrepreneur himself. Um, been working for more than 20 years, nearly 26 years now, various uh, background, mainly in finance. I've been in investment bank, um, you know, central bank. I've been in a big conglomerate uh, serving, you know, five different industries. Uh, and uh, I've been uh, on this job at Credo for nearly a year. And it's such an honor for me to serve Malaysia because especially at this pandemic times where, you know, a lot of our early stage startups need a lot of support. And I'm just very honored uh, to have this position and, and great to meet all of you. Thank you, Mindy. Hi, everyone. My name is Pris. I'm from Singapore and I am currently the CIO at Repra. Um, so Repra is a venture builder and our mission is through research and practice, we want to co-create new industries that have positive impact to society. Um, our firm is actually based in Tokyo, Singapore, Thailand and Vietnam. We have about 55 people. Our portfolio is over 60 different companies and actually many of them cradle supports. Yay. <laughs> uh, and Rafiza, you have three kids. I mean, I cannot imagine. Uh, I have one kid and I think after having Ashley, I never thought of having another one um, because it's, you know, really, really tough sometimes. Um, and I think my background before I joined Repra, I was mainly in finance uh, as well. Um, I probably spent about 10 years in finance in multiple roles. Um, but the role that I really fell in love in was um, mergers and acquisitions. And that's where I actually started to meet a lot of entrepreneurs, homegrown entrepreneurs in Southeast Asia, like Charles and Keith, Thai Express. Um, and I think I really got inspired by them building, you know, big businesses with very little. And I think that started my interest in building businesses from scratch. And that's why I joined a venture builder at um, Repra. Thank you, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I know some people are dialing in, you know, in the middle of the night and some people are dialing in early in the morning. So thank you for making time to be with us today. And thank you so much, Hai, for organizing this amazing panel. I'm so excited to be joining everyone and having a thoughtful chat. Uh, quick introduction. My name is Joan Lowe and I'm the founder and CEO of Thoughtful. Thoughtful is a digital mental health company whose vision is to make access to mental health care seamless and affordable in Asia. Now we leverage things like behavioral science and AI so that our app uh, Thoughtful Chat actually empowers users to engage with their mental health earlier through evidence-based self-service tools as well as daily bite-sized coaching with professionals. We're also enabling counselors and psychologists to digitize and build a very future-ready career. Now, I'm Malaysian originally, and I'm now based in Singapore. Uh, not originally, I'm still Malaysian. Uh, and I'm based in Singapore, so uh, very much missing my family back home, but, you know, um, have my own family here in Singapore as well. Uh, husband is in the, the crypto space, so a very, very different uh, situation from me. Uh, and I think later what we'll be discussing when we talk about balancing, you know, careers and family and all of that, I think we'll dig a little deeper into that. Uh, but before that, I'll pass it back to Mindy. Awesome. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you for an amazing introduction. Well, before I start, I would like just to share, um, you know, because uh, I've been reading up a lot about, uh, um, you know, gender equality and, you know, what are some of the studies and statistics out there these days about uh, having women in companies. And, you know, a study by MIT recently um, have shown that over the last 10 years, there are actually twice as many women on board of publicly traded companies in the France, UK, US, and Germany. And in the US, companies in the top quartile actually of board companies, board uh, listed companies are actually more diverse. They saw an average higher, 53% uh, higher shareholder equity return. And, you know, women actually make a difference on board. Um, but however, you know, progress of getting women in leadership positions is still certainly 
you know, a question. Uh, and achieving workplace gender parity is, um, is still a question as well. Um, a recent study by BBC have shown that numbers are slowing down and there still remains a huge gender bias gap in the working world. So especially for women who are still looking to rise the ranks. Um, so I think this, this, this topic around rising the rank and um, having a gender by addressing the issue of gender bias gaps in workplace is really important, something that we want to address today or talk and discuss. So these ladies have been, you know, they're amazing. They have achieved many things. They've raised the ranks and, and, and are founders as well as leaders in their own entities today. So let's talk about uh, being in a male-dominated working environment, right? We all are in it, and we've been it, been in it. Um, maybe perhaps uh, the panelists can share the biggest challenge you have faced being a women leader in a male-dominated working environment. Um, have you ever asked yourself why you have to be extra careful of what you say as a woman? So perhaps um, we can start off with either Rafiza or Pris. Do you want to start off? Okay, I can start. Um, okay, um, I started off with uh, finance, banking, and it's uh, quite a male-dominating uh, industry, and especially in Malaysia. Uh, when you know, when you're at a manager level, uh, you don't really feel so much of the pressure. But the minute you start to be at a C-suite, so I was made a CFO of a Malaysian investment bank at the age of thirty-one, and um, a lot of the times people surprised were surprised uh, that I'm a female. I get a lot of emails addressing me as Mr. Even though my name is clearly very feminine because they just assume that I'm a man, right? And I've been to a number of meetings where, you know, I will bring, say, for example, my manager who is a male, and then they will direct my, you know, my assistant to sit at the, you know, at the, at the, at the, you know, guests and thinking that I'm the assistant instead. So I've been through all that, but um, I think the important thing is that, um, you know, sometimes you need to understand why people act certain way, you know, it could be their background, the way how they were brought up. And uh, what I noticed is that for now, um, you know, this, this, the last couple of 10 years, it's been very different from when I first started off uh, my career. Um, there's a lot more visible, you know, women uh, leaders out there uh, who have proven. So now gender is not so much of an issue compared to before. So um, my, you know, my take on ladies is that uh, do not do not take it, you know, um, like, you know, do not get upset if people treat you just, you know, just, um, you know, be cool about it and then just smile and um, just let it go um, because sometimes you don't know why they do certain things. So, yeah, um, I think that's, yeah, that's just based on my experience, Mindy. Uh, Priscilla, do you want to add anything? Yeah. Or Sure, thank you. So, you know, before this panel, I was like drawing a timeline of my whole career, which made me feel very old. Um, but <laughs> it, it made me also reflect like, you know, how many female bosses did I have throughout my career? Um, and, you know, what was it like? How was it different? So I, I think Rafiza explained more from a leader perspective. And so I would like to give another perspective where I was in Goldman in 2006 and I was supporting, you know, the training, the equity sales training desk. And I thought about the, 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 you know, the ratio of women and men, and actually it was quite equal. And actually I realized that my first boss was a, a, a really young uh, trader and she was the lead of the team and she was young and she was also a parent and, um, and, you know, very, how do I say this, a really strong, you know, persona for me. And I think that set the tone of, you know, what to be like. Right. So I think having a role model or having, you know, some form of imprint early in your career does help a lot. So I think from then on, I never really felt specific gender biases or at least I wasn't aware of it. You know, maybe I avoided it somehow. But I think this led me to think about how I wanted to behave when I was a team lead at Deloitte doing m and And I think this was the most difficult time in my career because my daughter uh, at that point of time was seven years old. Um, and I was running a deal with a team of three others. I think the situation was that out of 20 of us, there were only three women, 
right? Uh, and none of the, you know, the team members at that point of time were, were parents or were mothers specifically. And so it was 10 p.m. and I was, you know, we were running a deal and we needed to stay till at least 3, 4 a.m. to kind of reach the deadline. And I get a call and my daughter has really high fever, right? And I found myself in a position where I, I couldn't decide. I was like, okay, if I leave my team now, they would have to stay until 6 a.m. or to 10, you know, 10 a.m. in the morning and what would life be like for them? And then on the other hand, I was like, I really just want to drop everything and go home. Uh, I felt, you know, not being able to make a clear decision and, and feeling that guilt was something that like really made me, it, you know, made, made it really difficult for me. So I think that was my toughest experience. What about you, Joan? Um, I know Joan, um, you know, you're, you're, you you don't have kids yet, but um, you are thinking and, um, you know, you are running a startup. You've also been in um, the finance space as well before this. So why don't you share your challenges? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, so perhaps to give a bit of context, before I started Thoughtful, I was actually based in Hong Kong, where I was working at JP Morgan for six years. Uh, so it, I, I would have to say that it was obviously a very male dominated uh, industry, as you can imagine in finance. Uh, but I think similar to Pris, um, I was very lucky to have a couple of role models uh, who were female bosses. In fact, my hiring manager, who's now the CEO there, um, is female. Uh, very, you know, very powerful woman and uh, but but also had to uh, really sacrifice a lot to get there. Um, and I think this is something that is very common. Um, so, so to speak very candidly, right? Uh, when you're in those kind of situations uh, and you look up in finance, it's very, it's very set. The corporate ladder is, is pretty much a structure that you just uh, predict in five years, 10 years where you'll be. Uh, and and the, the one thing that I did notice and observe uh, was that some had to sacrifice more than the others. And a lot of the times the onus were on uh, the women who had to carry it as well. Um, those decisions that Pris had to make at 3 a.m. were a lot of decisions that others had to make as well. Um, I think for, for uh, me personally, as you know, a junior working up the ranks, ooh, sorry, I think that's like a feedback. Um, for, for someone working up the ranks, uh, a couple of things that were very real, right? I think um, one is that uh, you, you mentioned something, Mindy, about watching what you say uh, and, and you know, whether there are things that you're more conscious of. Um, I think it wasn't so much of a gender lens as it was uh, just the, the, the environment, uh, but perception, is, uh, perception and safety is something that someone who is a woman in the finance world will need to know, uh, especially if you're on the client facing side uh, and you're managing clients, you have to go out, you're, you know, you have to, to entertain clients and, and take them out for meetings. Um, those are things that I think women will have additional things to think about, uh, to, to be a bit more aware about uh, versus, you know, my male colleagues who obviously can just, you know, uh, do that without the same kind of considerations. Uh, so I think that's just an inherent uh, thing. It shouldn't be that way, but it, it kind of is. Uh, and, and you just have to kind of uh, 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 build it within, within the DNA and the system. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, uh, if let's say you are a woman who's looking to thrive and grow in any kind of, you know, uh, industry that you're in, whether it's finance, whether it's healthcare, whether it's marketing or advertising, all of these um, nuances will always be there. Uh, but I think uh, for us, we have the agency to make choices. Uh, and I chose to work of all the Wall Street banks to work in a bank that was very uh, fair, very flat um, and, and very open. Uh, so, you know, that culture allowed me to thrive in a way that I think other environments wouldn't have because by the age of 27, I was able to build a career and manage, you know, portfolio of 1.4B uh, US. And that could only happen with the right people and the right culture. And in those kind of environments that allow you to thrive, so long as you know your stuff and you have confidence in what you're doing, uh, it doesn't matter if you're male or female, you'll be able to have those opportunities to succeed. Uh, so we have that agency to choose. And I would say, you know, make those choices.
Yeah. I think that's really uh, wise. And in fact, you know, a lot of times in my career, I always ask myself, right, like choices that you make is where it, where it will take you in terms of a career. And you should actually take charge of your own career personally. You should know, for example, you know, who are the leaders? Who are you reporting to? You know, what does, what is this company made out of, right? Because there are, to be honest, you know, um, uh, companies that uh, have uh, quite conservative leadership and, um, and conservative leadership have shown in past histories to basically not vote for women in or promote women in, in leadership positions. So if you have a direct boss, if you have a, um, you know, a company that you're looking for to, to get a job, uh, or even associate yourself with, then you know, look at the leadership, look at the decision makers, right? Who are they, um, and and how can how can they uh, help propel you or help your business in any way? Um, I share that same viewpoint as well through my experience uh, working as well as starting companies. Um, but let's talk a little bit, a little bit about uh, environments because you know. Um, all of you have worked in, uh, you know, US and, and, and other countries like Hong Kong and Singapore. So, but, you know, in terms of Western and Asian uh, based companies, do you feel there's any difference in culture and, um, and how uh, that benefits or not benefits um, women in general in rising up the ranks? Um, uh, anyone who wants to start? Perhaps I could uh, jump in in terms of the differences in culture. Um, so, so I think uh, there are two folds. On the personal side, I've obviously experienced some of that as well. Um, being uh, having spent a lot of time actually in North America and also, you know, in in, in Asia. Um, but then on the professional side as well. A lot of the work that Thoughtful does is to roll out, you know, mental well-being uh, uh, programs for uh, companies uh, on, on a large-scale basis. Uh, and so what that gives us is a lot of visibility into how different companies work, uh, the different culture, uh, the structure, decision-making processes, and, and all of that. Um, and I think um, the, the one thing that um, we do find uh, is that... And, Pardon me if I'm generalizing. This is just solely based on our own data points, my own data points, um, and, and not and uh, I cannot speak on behalf of other people. Uh, but there are a couple of different uh, structures that we see, and I see this from a very organizational psychology approach. Um, in in American cultures, I think the 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 sense of the individual is quite high. Um, uh, and, and so, you know, individual voices, individual um, um, uh, career path uh, structuring is, is quite encouraged. Uh, and so as such, uh, one thing that, that you will find is that in those kind of environments, uh, it, they sometimes tend to be a bit more flat structurally uh, and organizationally. Uh, and as such, from that point of view, uh, how decisions are made, how voices are heard, how, uh, how you chart your own path as an employee uh, will differ. Uh, versus uh, going into European companies where there's a little bit more layering, um, and then you go into Asian uh, companies where uh, there are layers, but not just vertical, there's also horizontal. Uh, so, so you kind of have a 360 kind of layering. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, within teams, you have teams within teams. And then, uh, you know, sometimes uh, that will also uh, then flow through the culture, uh, the way uh, people communicate with each other, whether, you know, uh, from senior to junior or whether across peers. Uh, and I think uh, a lot of how a company is structured uh, will determine the kind of life you will have working within it. Uh, so, you know, if if I were to go back into the workforce, I probably won't anytime soon. Uh, the the first thing I'll probably do is actually to study the the the, the structure of the company. How is it how is it set up? Uh, because that's how the humans within that will be incentivized and that's how they will interact with each other. Uh, so those were some of the, the different nuances. Uh, can go on and on about this, but I'll just stop here. <laughs> Thanks yeah, for think, sharing. Yeah, please go ahead. I was gonna ask like if you could share a bit more, you know, from the perspective also as like a startup or a smaller company. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So I think I second what Joan is saying. It's it. I tend to my personal experience is relatively flat. Organizations tend to embrace or be more mindful about inclusiveness and diversity. Um, and I think in larger working environment, like big corporates, I'm not sure whether gender is you know something specific that I've a biasness is something I've experienced before, but number of years of experience or how young you are matters more. But when in a in a in a more flat environment, I think you know everybody's view is is needed and appreciated, or at least that's the way you know I experience it. Now, yesterday I I read um you know about one fund and and you know this fund manager invests uh, using a matrix called say to do ratio. So I think what happens is you you meet a leadership team and you you read the culture, you read the values. I think. And you have to be, you feel aligned to it and feel like they will, you know, they would care about you and take care of you. But at the same time, you need to look at the, how the words are translated into actions uh, for the organization. And that filters into incentives and in, in, it filters into benefits that employees get. So I think I tend to try to look at that say to do ratio. Um, I do think that, you know, today, the, the organizations are much more mindful about it compared to, I don't know, 15 years ago when I started working. Um, did, have I seen any specific benefits or you know, incentives that really drive this kind of equality of inclusiveness? I think, I think not so much yet. I think um, you know, there are certain you know, considerations for mothers, working mothers, or you know, people, uh, or maybe the, the younger generation in the organization to, to kind of boost them. There's a lot of learning and development. You know, a lot of companies also speak to Jones business to support the overall well-being of, you know, um, of employees. But I haven't yet seen anything very, you know, kind of pointed to, to drive certain equality um, you know, or gender equality uh, environment. So I think that's something that the, that organizations can look at more. Definitely, definitely. Um, Rafiza, are you there? I know you had a bit of yes. um, Wi-Fi <laughs> issues. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Um, I was just gonna ask if you could answer a question around, you know, um, how would you break the glass ceiling and, you know, encourage the removal of gender biases in the workplace? You know, what kind of culture would you create if you were the leader or if you were starting a company um, so that, you know, people can start a, uh, I would say, a principle and, um, and a methodology that would grow with them, right? So mm -hmm. would you share a bit? Yeah. So um, the good thing about, you know, me being at Cradle is because we have a very small lean team. There's only 35 of us. Uh, so what I have done is, in fact, I specifically don't put any intervention because what has happened is that I've been in organizations where, you know, they made it clear that they want to encourage more, you know, women leaders and etc. But, and, and I'm part of a women leader and then there are stigma around like, you know, they question whether am I, you know, am I there because I'm qualified or because I'm a woman leader and they just need to fill in a certain quota. And I think, um, yes, there are probably a certain organizations where you need a little bit of intervention, but I wouldn't really want to put it out there to say that, oh, I, I need to fill in a space and I really need a woman. I think women need to feel that they are actually qualified and that's got nothing to do uh, with their gender. That's one thing. And um, secondly, in, um, in the organization, we, you know, we, we promote work-life balance both for male and female. Um, you know, so it's not just mothers you know, and, and we made it clear because there are also fathers that who are, you know, very committed to their family, they need to take time off and etc. So we don't feel like as if, oh, just because you're women that you're, you're, you're extra special. So men are given, you know, certain privileges as well. So it makes, uh, you know, it, it makes everyone feel that, oh, there's nothing special being a woman or being a mother or being a father, uh, everyone is treated equally. And um, be because I have been in uh, organizations where, you know, they don't, they, 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 they make you feel like as if, or if you need to, to have 
to, to, to have time off because your kid is sick or you've got to go to school. They, they make it sound like as if, oh, why do you have to do that? And they assume that you're not committed. So, so we made it clear in at Cradle is that everyone is committed as long as you get the work done or get someone else to, to, to do that with you. Uh, every, everyone should have the equal rights. Yeah. Yes, sorry. Um, I was uh, trying to turn on my mute button, turn off my mute button. <laughs> um, so just leading to that, um, you know, why don't we talk a little bit about balancing work life family? Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of the biggest challenge I think women face every day is their guilt of playing multiple roles in their lives, you know, from having heavy duties as being a mom, wife, daughter, boss, CEO, um, and then trying to run a startup who is actually your only baby, right? Your other baby that you're trying to grow. Um, so should women feel guilty at all for having to play these many roles? And, and how do you juggle these multiple roles? Do you want to, maybe Rafiza can start first, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I've, look, um, when, I was a senior leader of an organization and I was pregnant. I was heavily pregnant with my third one. And I have to juggle attending board meetings, you know, uh, during my confinement because, you know, that's the year where we have to, uh, you know, uh, close our accounts. My, my take is that if I could turn back the clock, that guilt is a waste of time. You know, there's no reason for you to feel guilty at all. Why should you, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, I, I felt that all those, all those emotion feeling guilty to me, is just a waste of time. Now, the important thing is, is that your partner and your family needs to be very, very supportive. So from day one, uh, they need, they, they are equally partners or they need to give a lot of support and they shouldn't question you. Say, for example, if one day I said, could you please, um, you know, look, uh, meet the teachers instead today so they shouldn't question things like that um, your kids as well um, maybe when they are a bit younger they will question I've got you know my kids asking me oh is it why, why is it that always dad that comes and pick me up and stuff like that you know uh, but when they are bigger uh, and and they've seen the difference between you know you being a, uh, me being a working mom and some of their friends of course they compare right um, then they begin to understand there is you know more than just picking the kids up at school so I think, um, and, and I find it, it's a lot younger now that my all my three kids are all teenagers. So they understand, they never, they never question. They, like, for example, there's been times when I'm supposed to take them away, uh, you know, for the weekend and we've all packed and then suddenly I said, sorry guys, I can't, could we do it over the weekend? No, you know, no, no, they don't blink. They said, yeah, sure, mom. Yeah, that's fine, you know. So I think that helps as well, um, you know, engaging with them being transparent with them why you know you they can't compare uh you know with me with other mothers so don't feel guilty because there are a lot of other strengths that you can an advantage that you can concentrate on thank you how about you pris what are your thoughts here Oh, I was thinking if, you know, I was Rafiza's teenage kid and she cancelled on me on, on a holiday, I would be like, ah! <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, I think it's great that, you know, they, they you know, they don't, uh, they accept it and, and actually they're very supportive, Rafiza. So really good for you. Um, so, I don't know, when I, when I heard Rafiza share, I had a lot of, like, emotions and thinking back to all the times that I felt guilt. And I totally agree that guilt is actually really not so constructive as an emotion for, for, for me or for anyone. Um, and I was thinking, you know, what would I change if I went back in time? I think that, I think there are certain things I think I would change or I would do differently, but there are also certain things I feel that the environment could be different as well to help me, you know, feel less guilt. So I think from an action standpoint, I think, uh, you know, tapping on Joan's point on, that you have the agency to kind of make decisions. I think you have to use courage and conviction, you know, with, with, uh, you know, with that agency to really make these de decisions on what is important for you. So understanding what is important for me at that point of time was really important. I think I had a very short-term mindset at that point of time. You know, it was about the deadline, you know, that one deal, but life is much longer than that, you know. And so 
I think I I would I want I would have probably tried to be to think more long term, to guide my decision making that day, um, and I think that would have reduced the guilt, because you know I I I invest in the long term, uh you know uh of of you know within the you know the three stakeholders at that point of time myself the company and also, um and also my daughter, so I think one is I would have taken a more proactive approach to communicate the struggles that I have with my team, I think I made an assumption that people will not understand. And I think that, I think it's a mistake. I think people do understand and you have to give them an opportunity to, um, to, to, to kind of prove you right. So that's one. I think number two, if the organization maybe was more verbal about being supportive uh, and actually had a more supportive culture, no matter whether you are male or female, right, whether you are, you know, experienced or inexperienced, but to be supportive when you're struggling, I think that would have helped me express it more and reduce the guilt. I totally agree. In fact, um, I had, was very pregnant when I joined a accelerator program for one of my startup. I was about five months pregnant. I finished the accelerator program at seven months, and then I actually gave birth and, you know, um, was still, uh, just starting the startup. So it was really a challenge for me, um, but you know, uh, I don't regret it. I think the experience was was really uh, uh, something that will stay with me forever. And there were so many things that that I did, I would I would not turn back time, you know, I my team was very supportive. It was a small company. We only had like three people working, but everyone was very supportive and helpful in making sure we still meet deadlines. We still progress with the company. Um, Joan, turning, going to you. Um, I know you don't have kids yet, um, but you are starting a new uh, company. And I mean, sorry, your, your company is a startup and, and you have that as your baby. You know, what are your thoughts here? Um, and, you know, do you ever feel like you have the pressure to, uh, have have a family or do you think that it's not the right time now do share your thoughts uh sure i think uh i feel like the baby here because i i'm, I'm like three kids behind <laughs> uh, so so i i look at it as i have two startups right one is the startup that is my family uh and then one that is the startup that is thoughtful uh, very much so thoughtful is currently my first child, I would say, through all the growing pains, as you do. Um, but I think uh, to speak very openly, and I'm pretty sure, you know, of all the people who are on the, you know, in the audience, some of you might relate as well. Uh, you know, when you're in your 30s, you're starting a family, uh, the pressure is real. Um, and the pressure sometimes can be a little bit more in uh, an Asian context, uh, where apparently there's a, a lot more say <laughs> from, from the parental unit uh, on when you're supposed to have children, why you're supposed to have children, how many, all of that. Uh, um, my family's, you know, no different. Uh, uh, definitely, you know, there are always uh, hints and talks of, you know, when's your next child, they send you photos of babies and all of that. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, um, you know, it, it will always be a question of uh, when is the right time. Um, uh, and, and again, I'm speaking for myself, uh, not everyone uh, views building a family the same way. Uh, children is not for everyone, not everyone will want to have children. Uh, and that is also completely fine. Uh, and we should not feel any form of guilt for not you know, seeing that as part of our life. It's just so happened that that is, you know, the, the more normalized form of what a family looks like. Uh, but for myself, I'm definitely, you know, I, I do like babies. Um, uh, I just don't know when it will be. Um, so I think a lot of the challenge is, you know, do I do it now? Uh, but, but there will always be things that will uh, take precedence sometimes. Oh, I need to fundraise first. Oh, I need to, you know, build a product first. The product needs to get to A, B, C first. The team needs to get to this number first uh, before I do that. Uh, and, and if there's one thing that I learned from the corporate setting and having looked, you know, above me and observed uh, around me uh, is that you cannot put any aspect of your life on hold uh, for, for you know, shorter term goals. There are some things that are long term. Uh, there are some things that uh, only you can make and you, know, you can decide. Um, and at the end of the day, a business is a business. Uh, the business might be here. The business might not be here. 90% of startups fail. This is the reality of the situation. Uh, do 
90% of pregnancies fail? No. Do 90% of families fail? No. Um, and I think, you know, taking a step back from the short-term pressures to have a macro view of what your long-term life will be is so, so important. Uh, so for me, for example, I know it will happen. Um, I know also, you know, the timing is not always up to you. You can try, but then it's up to God when they give it to you. <laughs> um, and so, you know, knowing that there are some things that you can control, which, you know, is to make the decision whether you're going to go ahead with it, when you're going to uh, time it. Uh, and then some things that are beyond your control, which I think you kind of just have to let go. Um, I think those are a lot of the, the, the things that come into play. Uh, and if you're an entrepreneur out there um, who's thinking of either starting a company or already started the company or trying to, you know, uh, build your company from the next, this level to the next, um, always, you know, take that step back and then ask yourself, like at the end of the day, which one's going to be the most important? Uh, and I always, you know, take that macro view whenever I have to make any big life decisions. Um, so for me, family will always, you know, be first. Um, and, and I think it's always a misconception that just because you prioritize family, you cannot have the other parts of it. Uh, you can, it's just going to be done in a different way. Uh, and, and I think if there's anything women time and again uh, have proved is that we're fantastic at multitasking and we're mostly innately built to be super women juggling different things. Uh, and if you have that agency to surround yourself with the right support system, you'll be fine. Totally agree. Totally agree. Um, in fact, one of the things about support system that I always think about, and I always question um, is around um, leaders and mentors. You know, early on, I think um, Pris and Rafiza also touched base about this a little bit. And, and I always wonder, uh, where do I find these women mentors? You know, or, or should my mentor be a woman? Can it be a man? Would it help me in my career or, or, or help me get to where I want to be? Um, you know, I had uh, a, a male, I have a male mentor uh, from the US and he's, you know, he is still my mentor until today. Uh, we don't live in the same country, but we continue to talk and converse and, and keep in touch. And he's continued to guide me in my career and, and my, my aspirations. So what about you guys, you know, um, who, how do you find mentors and do they have to be women mentors? Actually, Mindy, um, uh, just to, oh, sorry, go ahead, Rafisa. It's okay, Joan, yeah. Oh. Go ahead, John. Uh, no, because it, it actually just, uh, when you brought that up, um, it just ties back to the last point. So uh, one of the mentors who told me uh, this, who gave me this macro perspective um, was actually a male. Um, so he's, you know, it's, he's someone who I've known for, for more than, you know, 10 years. He's seen me grown uh, from college time all the way till now. Uh, he built a very successful company. Uh, he exited Job Street, you know, a couple of years ago, Mark. Um, and he's someone who I've known for a very long time. Uh, and when we sat down and had that conversation, uh, that was the, you know, from, from a male uh, who's, you know, seen the whole life cycle of the tech industry starting from the 90s all the way till now. Uh, I thought that was uh, very, very eye opening. Uh, so I think, again, it's not so much of whether um, it should be a male or a female. Uh, it's a matter of uh, what is it in the different facets of my life uh, that I would love to, you know, delve a little deeper on, have a different perspective on, have some guidance on. Uh, and then based on that, you look for the subject matter expert, right? Whether it's a guy or a girl, uh, a girl. I think that's, that's really the approach that we take. Um, yeah, I mean, happy to share about uh, mentorship and things like that later, because I have a lot of mentors in my life. And yeah, but Rafiza, please, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, it's okay. Um, what works for me is that I don't have what I call them mentors. Uh, for me, it's the people around me. Um, so pre-pandemic, right, I, I, I make it a point to have lunch with, you know, my, my ex-bosses or the people, my ex-colleagues that I've worked with, um, you know, my peers, uh, try, try to meet up with them once in a while. And, and I, I would, you know, ask, it's more tailor-made questions on certain things. Like for example, you know, I just reach out um, to someone, how do you deal with boards? You know, how do you manage stakeholders? How do you deal with certain things? So how, how, how do you deal with, you know, even family matters? Um, I've got 
four um, very established women CEOs, uh, high high leaders that I have lunch with, uh, and and we just bounce ideas. And what do you guys think? It's uh, you know I've I've gone out of having a mentor. For me, it's more of a role model. I look for a role model. Uh, some some really you know women leaders role model. And I pick and choose. Uh, there, are, there, are, you know, certain things I agree. Certain things, you know, I think I can, you know, I can, I, I can, you know, I can follow that. But there are certain things where I said, well, that's not me. But, but at the end of the day, um, I really feel that you need to be genuine. You need to know what your strengths are and really leverage on that. Um, and having people that who knows you very well, your former bosses, you know, that helps as well. And your colleagues or even, you know, uh, very good friends because they know you and they can be very, very objective. Uh, they have, um, you know, no personal agenda or whatever to be really honest with you. And, you know, that's, that's probably a way. Uh, some people prefer just to talk to one person. But uh, for me, I much rather have talked to different people. Yeah. Yes, I think I'm a mixture of, of all. I think um, my bosses are usually my mentors inherently because our, I guess our incentives are aligned and we all want to go in the same direction. So I think, I think I've always seen my bosses as, you know, sometimes role models and, and mentors. Uh, I think value alignment is important. Um, whether male, female, um, it, it's more about values uh, and openness. Like, you know, if I had a mentor, I would want to, you know, be challenged. Well, not all the time. I don't want to be challenged all the time. But, you know, you want somebody to, you know, really tell you what other people, you know, don't, don't dare to tell you, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think I look, I, I am attracted to that kind of, um, kind, how do I say this, constructive uh, criticism. Uh, and I know it's not easy for me to get it on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think that's one thing I look out for. Similar to Rafiza, I look a lot at role models. So I, I'm a big, I'm very big on biographies. Um, and I think Catherine Graham from Washington Post, if any of you watched the movie, The Post, yes. um, was very inspiring for me because she made mission-driven decisions at a board level. She was also the very first female publisher. Um, and, and she, you know, that was in 1963. I mean, one thing we have to appreciate is that different eras have very stark differences and challenges of being a woman. Um, and I think her particular story was moving because, you know, she was never made to take over the company. Her husband was the one that was running the company and unfortunately he committed suicide and she, it had to fall into her lap. And she had to take over, you know, a media company, right, uh, with no role models in place. She was the first, you know, leadership position in, in, in media. And in the show, you will see that she sits alone with a whole room of bankers, lawyers, uh, you know, and, and board, independent board members. And, you know, I think she really um, expressed how difficult it was because everybody belittled her decision making. Um, but at the end of the day, she was, you know, chairman of the board for a very long time. And, and, and she made, I felt, really good you know, uh, uh, mission-driven decisions. And so whenever I face an issue and if I, you know, for some reason don't feel like going out to anybody to pour my vulnerabilities, you know, I think of these people to help me. Uh, I think um, if, if I could just like jump in on, on one point as well is that uh, sometimes people, uh, two points, sometimes people when they look for mentors, they only look up. Uh, for all these like very successful, highly covered P with PR kind of persons. Uh, sometimes it doesn't have to only be uh, those role models who can be mentors. Uh, it could literally be your mom. It could be people in your life. It could be uh, your peers. It could be people who uh, are working for you uh, and, and, and across all levels. Because um, at the end of the day, uh, Rafiza, I think what you were saying was so great because it's not just about that orderly mentorship, which I think is now like a programized thing. Uh, as long as we have the curiosity to keep on learning, uh, and literally anyone or anything you get in touch with can be a mentor or can teach you something. Um, and so, so that's one. And then I think the other aspect as well is really looking beyond and looking outside. Um, so, you know, Mindy, similar to you, um, I have mentors literally 
from various random places in my life where it has taken me. Um, and I think one of the beauties of actually uh, building relationships with complete strangers before and then really learning about, you know, what they're doing is that they give you a perspective that is different. And it takes you out of number one, your comfort zone. It also, you know, helps you avoid having a myopic view. Because if you only look for advice for people who have the same context as you, that will be the only context you will have. Uh, and I think adding on different contexts globally, uh, different cultures, uh, different kind of levels and backgrounds, so important. Uh, because then, you know, it broadens our minds without having to leave our chair, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. In fact, you know, um, I was just thinking, you know, for what about for people who don't have mentors at all and who are just really starting out this whole new idea, right? Like say you are 20 years old and you just need some guidance, maybe not your parent, but some, but not your family members, but just someone, where do they go to and, and who do they reach out to, right? Because they obviously can't be reaching out to um, you know, like a CFO of a big bank, you know, or a big co uh, corporation because they probably don't have access there. Unless they have access, then they're lucky. But if they don't, like, what, what do they do, right? Where do they find these role models So and 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 mentors? So I think, Joan, you, you touched it very, very well in, in the sense that it doesn't have to be someone, you know, career related. It could be someone who is um, just, you know, around you. And uh, and also, you could also find someone who would recommend you to to someone. And, and, and as long as you are brave and courageous to go talk and be be, uh, I would say, uh, curious, I think people will, will be happy to introduce you to, to someone else who may end up being your mentor, right? I might challenge that and say, like, if you want to talk to that CEO, go talk to that CEO. Drop <laughs> that person a message. And if you can't get there, then, you know, find all the people around that person who will get you there. Uh, because I think we shouldn't, you know, limit ourselves just because we are self-perceived as oh I'm so young or blah 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 but of course you know do the internal reflection know exactly why you're reaching out for what uh and and just go for it yeah sorry I, I Ameri it. American style yeah I, I, I find it a lot easier sorry oh, when, no, no, when you okay. when you go for conferences you introduce yourself you meet someone but now that you know there's no more conferences no more network events I find it you know quite difficult so if you have friends that know someone maybe can do a good in, a good introduction okay sorry Matty no no I'm so sorry to cut you guys off honestly this has been so amazing like this exact question too I did not want to even stop you guys it's so good it's so useful but we are absolutely running up to our time and we definitely have a lot of questions. So if all the speakers are available and if our attendees want to hang on, we can <clears throat> extend this for another 10 minutes, but we definitely need to pivot to, to Q&A now. So thank you guys so much. I'm so sorry. I don't want to cut you guys off because everything you guys have been saying is so important, especially about mentorship. All of the different ideas that you guys are giving up are so important. I'm taking notes. <laughs> so thank you guys. Thanks, Maddie. Sorry, um, I was watching, looking at time, but I know the conversation was just so good. So I had to let everyone speak. I agree. Um, so, <laughs> so I'm just looking at the questions here. So we're going to take 10 minutes um, to go through these questions. Um, and, and, and one of the questions that was quite interesting was um, around um, having, how do you, so the idea is that if you're a, you're a founder or someone who is looking for to earn someone's business, um, how do you deal with double standards from the clients? Um, you know, especially when you are really in need of their business, but you don't really want to be treated as any lesser or, or being discriminated at any at some point. Um, how do you deal with that situation? Because I'm sure you have come across situations like that before. Anyone? Um, okay, if I can just chip in uh, my two cents worth. Um, for me, it's very important. I have a lot of situations where people just you know try to provoke me um and you know my advice is and and how i deal with it is just maintain professionalism uh do not let uh people you know that that you get irked by it or whatever and that's that's how i tend to deal with it um i think um it does need a little bit of work uh, you unfortunately you need to you know pay a little bit attention to how to prove yourself that you're actually capable of doing that but once you've earned the trust and it's the same with, with everything else you know even even non-gender uh, type of 
um, you know, a reputation, uh, proven track records. Um, so to me, that's, that's how I deal with it. And, and, you know, sooner or later, then they will come to see that, you know, you're actually, you know, you're actually good at what you're doing. So just have faith in yourself. Chris or Joan, do you want to answer that? I I think I'm not sure if I have been in that position and I'm trying to like go through my, my memory list, but I think sometimes we need to understand what is the real maybe um, reason. Sometimes it could be that you're inexperienced. Sometimes maybe you were not confident enough in a specific meeting. You know, maybe, um, you know, the client felt that, you know, they wanted somebody who had more specific experience. I, I think it, it be, it's easy to just say it's a gender thing. And I think that's the part where I would reflect more on a little bit more. And if it, it's indeed a gender thing, I would actually consult my manager, right? Um, and maybe bring more people in into the meeting to support and trying to build that, that trust with the client. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we the, the world is very big and it takes all sorts to make the world. And I think uh, at some point, these kind of situations will happen. Uh, it has definitely happened before. Uh, but I think very similar to um, Rafiza, what you were saying, right? Uh, keep it professional. Um, if it's the, 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 the work and the service or what you can offer that is the problem, then we deal with that. If it's my gender, then it's something personal. Uh, if the client is really worth going, you know, the, the full nine yards for, bring someone else in, surround yourself with a team that can mitigate that situation. Uh, but if it's not, then there are many fish in the sea, forget about it. Is that a client you actually want to get in a contract with? Uh, because if your values don't align, this is probably the first tip of the iceberg. Once you're contractually tied together, uh, it could be hell. Uh, is that worth going through? Uh, so I think those are questions that are probably quite important to, to, to decide. Yeah. I agree. I agree in all your thoughts. Um, because I went through the same thing as well. And I, I thought I reflected and thought the exact same thing. So I think we are aligned in that. Um, in terms of a um, different question from someone else here, uh, it's a this is a very interesting one. It says, one of my friends has a stay-at-home dad who is a PhD physicist and takes care of four kids and mom goes to work as a doctor. What do you think of the reverse roles of dads being the homemaker? 100%, yes. <laughs> 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 to me, I think we need to, you know, uh, to really convince the guys that just because they are stay at home, that it doesn't make you less of a man. Um, in fact, I have a lot of respect of men who, you know, who are, you know, who, who spends, who, who sacrifice uh, their career to be with their kids. I have a lot of, and, and because I think it comes from, a, you know, the men themselves, they feel that or they're, 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 they're not complete uh, because they don't bring in the, the money and things like that. No, you know, maybe, maybe 30, 40 years ago, yeah. But nowadays, you know, it doesn't matter who brings in the money. At the end of the day, you know, the, the time spent is far valuable than, you know, the money that you bring in. You know, that's, that's how I feel. I think we need to change, uh, you know, that, that perception. Yeah. I think totally love the idea. And I think that you know, if the father is a stay-at-home dad, he should get the same benefits and support that I expect to get if I'm the stay-at-home mom or I'm the, the, the nurturer in the, in, 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 in the relationship. I think, um, so th this was, it, this brought back a, a, a memory. So uh, I was living in Paris then and we were having like, I don't know, random presentations in class and uh, the, these two students from Amsterdam were presenting on, uh, you know, just the the, the social structure of um, of, of, uh, of the Dutch policy system, uh, and one of it was actually on paternal, you know, paternal perks and rewards uh, that trickles down from the government all the way down to across all employers. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, this panel that we have today is not just about women empowerment; it's driving towards equality. And equality does not mean that. It's to the uh, to 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 the detriment or to the negative of the other gender. It means that we are on bringing everyone up to an equal par. Uh, so if you know the guy in the relationship 
loves doing what he wants to do with the kids, by all means, like there shouldn't be any prejudice. Um, I think there might be a bit of a generational difference as well, because what I do find these days is that my peers are actually quite open with these things. Um, it's not as stigmatized anymore. Uh, and I think it's, you know, the idea is a bit more normalized. Um, and I think at the end of the day, when it comes to you know, you, lifting up someone's self-esteem or, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, getting them comfortable with that decision, uh, it also has to boil down to the dynamics of the couple itself and the relationship. Sure, if the woman can be bringing in more money, but if you're reminding him every day that you're the one bringing the bacon home, that's going to just be like a relationship train wreck, basically. Uh, so I think the mutual respect needs to be there, uh, whether it's the woman or the men who are taking on these roles, mutual respect, mutual help. Uh, and it's always about lifting each other up equally. Uh, so I think that's pretty important. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with that. In fact, you know, upon reflection, um, I always think the question it always becomes how how can we as women leaders communicate these important, um, I would say, uh, missions or visions or wants, right? And and messages. to our uh, messages, yes, to our our superiors or even let's say um, uh, a company with a senior leadership that has not face any of these changes right but the world is changing you know um and and many young people are now being placed on boards or being you know put in positions in leadership positions so how can we communicate that how can we help them understand uh that it's it's okay you know for for a female to be up in in leadership positions and it's also okay for men to take a step back and be at home if they want to, um, because there's always a, a, the struggle of juggling balance and, and life and work and money and things like that, right? So there's just so many aspects to it. Um, perhaps if I can just uh, ask one last question um, around uh, uh, advice from each and every one of you. Um, as you know, women leaders and founders, you know, what advice would you give to future first time women founders? I think the advice that I would give is the same as to, you know, whether they're female or male. I think hard work, a lot of sacrifice. Um, think of the end game, you know, uh, and, and don't give up. It's the same. I think um, male or female being, being founders of a startup, it's tough. <laughs> and, you know, they don't, they don't discriminate against, you know, um, against gender. So, yeah. Uh, I think I will repeat the, you know, what I said earlier to have courage and conviction. Also, you know, it's, it's, it's not relevant to just women, right? Um, I think the style of life is very <laughs> tough um, and I think you need a lot of help. So I think one thing is always ask for help, even if you think people won't help. I think you'll be pleasantly surprised that, you know, humans are generally very kind. Um, and I think then you are able to embrace yourself more and embrace others. Well, as the uh, founder representation over here, <laughs> I guess um, uh, I, I should share. Um, I should share some 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 uh, advice. Uh, it's not so much advice, but it's really just speaking from um, from from just actual experience as well uh, as a founder. I think. I agree that it, it doesn't matter if you're male or female, this will apply. Uh, know exactly why you're starting what you're starting uh, because the road is going to be up and down. It's going to be uh, not always, you know, the, the rosy picture you see out there. Uh, there's a lot of personal and also professional sacrifice that you take uh, to set out on this path. And if why, if the why of why you're doing it is not clear, the how and the what will is very easy to get de derailed completely. Uh, and it will be very uh, easy to burn out and lose momentum if you don't have that moral, the, the, the true north of the why pulling you uh, and anchoring you down for, for the whole of the journey. Uh, so take some time to think about that. Uh, speak to people, uh, validate the why as well, uh, as much as you validate your product and everything, validate all of that. Um, and, then, and then take, you know, 
take that plunge and then don't turn back. Uh, everyone's behind you. Uh, yeah. And reach out uh, to walk the walk. I mean, if anyone wants to, you know, connect or whatever, I think uh, I'm on LinkedIn. You you can always reach out. Uh, happy to happy to be of service. Thank you so much, Joan. Thank you so much, Rafiza and Pris too. This has really been amazing. I love all your experiences and sharing. Um, Yes, um, just as what Joan mentioned, please reach out to any one of us if you if anyone here from the audience would like to, you know, chat or you know, just have, um, who knows, a lunch or Zoom lunch, I guess, these days. <laughs> um, Zoom coffee. So yes, yes, Zoom coffee. <laughs> um, so Maddie, back to you. Oh, we can't hear you. Maybe. There we go. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I actually just put my email in the chat again, just so I can connect anyone who wants to talk to you guys and you guys with those individuals. So I'm happy to be the liaison for you guys. Um, what a phenomenal conversation. I am so happy that you guys even squeezed that mentorship piece in because that was like, oh, the pinnacle. And it actually hurt me to come on the screen and to tell you guys it was time to do Q&A. Uh, thank you all of the attendees that stayed on, even though we went over. I hope you all got something out of this amazing panel of women with such incredible stories. Thank you all for taking the time. And we hope that you guys join us for our next event. We love having you guys. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.